Hey, I'm Alex Rackle from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Temeri from Postscriptum Games. Temeri is a 1 to 4 player, worker placement, card driven, tableau game. There's a lot of things going on here. Oh, and there's also a giant marble shoot in the middle of the board. I should note this is a prototype, all rules, components, subjects to change. In particular, I believe this pyramid over here is going to look a lot nicer in the final copy. You can check out the game found page down below. I'll include a link to that as well, so you can get a better sense of what the final game will look like. But again, prototype, rules, components, and all that subjects to change. I'm going to try to go through the rules, but I'm not going to cover every interaction because there is a lot going on here. It's not that overwhelming, but there's just a lot and I don't want to get too lost in the details. The general idea of the game is that across three rounds of play or three seasons of play, you're going to go ahead and take four turns per round. I think they, the structure they have is a turn, a round, and then a season. They are a player's turn is their turn, all the turns together are the round, and then four rounds is a season. But practically speaking, in terms of, in terms of what you're going to be doing in this game, is your turn is going to consist of playing a card down to your personal player board. Let's move this forward a little bit. Your turn is going to consist of playing a card down onto your personal player board and taking an action or possibly multiple actions on that card. You're going to resolve your actions and then you're going to again do that again, not right away. Everyone's going to take their turn. You'll again play another card. You'll again play another card. You'll again play another card. These four cards that you play and the actions you take, that's going to determine the full season of play. You're going to do that three times and that's going to be the full game. Uh, but there's a lot more going on here and a lot of ways to get a whole lot of extra actions as you drive things forward in this game. So to drive it back a little bit, the first thing you're going to do every single round is you're going to check for the weather. Because the weather, that's going to be this little pyramid structure over here, that's going to determine how you can harvest from these various fields. You have different fields for the four basic resources over here, and players are going to be placing their workers down into the various fields over here to be able to harvest items or goods, the various four goods you have from these fields. But you're going to start by revealing a weather card. That weather card, combined with the specific season, right now in the water we see over here. So we're going to take three water and two more water because the weather card is going to determine part of it and then the default season is going to determine another. I'm going to drop those down into our, that's a rolling marble that we're going to go ahead and drop these down to our pyramid and see how things play out. Now over here, you're going to see that over here, we have two, we have a water and a sun touching each other. So because of that, we're going to remove them from the board. Whenever you have a water and a sun touching each other, you move them to the board. Whenever a silt would fall out, and some cards will have silt, and in the middle season, you're going to have silt by default. The silt's going to go into the fields, what's going to help the fields be more productive, and you're going to harvest more goods. So the first thing you do every round is you kind of determine the weather. That's going to affect players' actions because each field has a criteria for how you can harvest from them. This field over here, you can harvest this, these goods, if there's up to three water on these tracks, but not if there's any sun. Versus on this track, you can harvest if there's two water or sun, but not if there's three. Over here, you can harvest if there's sun, which means right now, no one in this field can harvest, and knowing what you can and can't harvest will affect players' actions. Once you're done with that, players are going to go ahead and select a card, and they're going to place that card face down on the tableau, and then activate that card either for its face down effect, so uh, on the back of the card, you can get a kind of wild card where you can take any one action. You'd have to pay for that, but you're also going to get these little bonus on the side, which can be very helpful. But normally, you're going to go ahead and resolve your card, turn it over, and then taking one or two actions, depending on if you line that card up to the icon before it, which for this start on the player board means always this icon, but again, if you play a card face down, then any icon will match that face down card on a subsequent turn. So knowing when to take that wild action and to pay for it, but giving you flexibility for a double action, that's a big part of the gameplay. Also, you get to go first if you do that, so that's another little fun bonus. But when you do that over here, you're taking one or two actions of the card, depending if you match that icon, and the actions in the game, we're going to go through the, I believe, eight actions, if I'm not mistaken. But we're going to go through the actions you can take in the game, because, well, let's walk through this over here. The first thing you can do in the game is you can go ahead and place farmers into the field. So you can place a farmer into the field to go ahead and uh, prep them to be able to harvest later. That's going to be this action over here. You can take a harvest action where you're going to go ahead and harvest in the fields based on the amount of silt in the fields, and again, you're trying to time that all up nicely. You can have a marketplace action over here, or a trader action, where you're going to send a person to the marketplace if you don't already have one, and you can trade one good for any two goods, or possibly claim all the goods from the middle. Goods will accumulate there, you'll be able to claim them over there. We have the building track over here, which is where you can go ahead and on these buildings over here, you can go ahead and move your builder up the track in order to go ahead and take one of these cards, paying the cost, but then getting the benefit, the ongoing or one-time benefit, as well as possibly scoring, and then as well as endgame scoring for these icons in the top corner. So a lot of decisions to be made over there. We're 
We're gonna have this track over here where you're going to donate resources. You're going to take resources, placing them behind your screen, and at the end of each season, you're going to get points for whoever donated the most of each resource. Uh, you know, you can get a bunch of points for that, but you are giving up resources, so points or resources, what are you trying to do right now? You also have the temple track over here. That icon's gonna be over here. On the temple track, you're going to be able to place a priest into one of the three temples and or advance them at the track, taking a variety of benefits, because there are a whole lot of benefits in this game, as well as some uh, priests that got knocked over by that rampaging marble. But you're gonna get anything from being able to get more workers, to being able to pl put farmers in play, to getting straight points, to getting more silt, and getting special priest cards, these powerful priest cards over here that give you stronger attachments and double actions. There's a lot of things you can do as far as getting uh, extra stuff in the temple, just trying to balance all those goodies there. Then down over here, you have the opportunity to either place a Sphinx into, if you ever see this icon on one of the cards, you can place a Sphinx into one of these 10, and these are randomized over here, which these are actions are double-sided. You're going to choose five from the A side, five from the B side, but that does mean you have a mix of 10 different abilities. You're going to place a Sphinx down, paying fruit to do so, and then activating all your Sphinxes. So it's a little bit of a tableau building, getting a stronger action. Once you get your third Sphinx in play, you can be getting a cycle of multiple actions every time you do that. You also have the potential to do a Scribe action, where you simply take the ability of any one of your Sphinxes, but you don't have to pay for the privilege, which again is a nice little twist over there. I think that covers the main action. I'm trying to think if I missed anything. I feel like I'm missing one, but I don't know what I'm missing. So we're going to go ahead and say those are the uh, eight core actions. It's actually a nice little play rate as well, but those are going to be the general actions in the game. Now you're trying to be mindful of all of this because all of these things cascade together. These buildings over here, they're going to give you more you can do as well as discounts and various things you can do or extra abilities. This priest track is going to give you extras. This sphinx track cascades into other abilities. The marketplace action just gives you resource, but resource flexibility is a big deal. Harvesting is going to give you a ton of resources, which is essential for being able to uh, move up the priest track because you have to pay resources to move up the priest track. And you also have to pay resources to donate to the god's favor. So you're trying to manage and to build buildings and to go ahead and activate the sphinxes. So you need to make sure you have a resource engine coming in. You're going to be doing all of that, and at the end of the turn, you're going to be selecting a new card to add to your hand from this row of cards over here. So every season, there's going to be a new deck of cards, and these cards, you're going to take one, add it to your hand, which will determine the abilities, as well as being mindful of how they might line up with the existing cards based on the action icons over here. So maybe I'll take this card, because I know it can match up to a card in my hand, I can get the double action, and I can even get the fruit that's laying on the card. When you're done with all that, you're going to go to the next turn, rinse and repeat until you get to the end of the season, where you're going to score points for your buildings. Your buildings over here are going to score points at the end of each season, which means getting the right building and prepping up can be a nice chunk of points you're getting consistently over the course of the game. You're going to do that for a full arc of the full seasons, uh, the full three seasons of the game, score up all your points, see who got the most, and that is basically what's going on in Temeri. Again, there are a lot of details we're missing out. I didn't really talk about, like, you know, the priest track at the end of each age. You're going to be getting a bunch of priest cards based on who's present in the priest in the, in the temples. So you're going to want to have presence here because first come, first serve as far as uh, the various temple tracks and getting a whole bunch of these cards, which can be a nice chunk of extra points and or abilities and flexibilities. I briefly talked about the priest cards over there. I, I didn't talk about the fact that as you, I'm, I'm trying to talk about, I'm trying to tell you all the things I didn't talk about. There's a lot of other peripheral details as far as how this game operates, but that's the core loop over here. A little bit of worker placement, a little bit of tableau building, a little bit of card driven actions and trying to match up icons to maximize your card actions and then trying to constantly determine the trade off as to what's the right move for you based on your engine at any given point in time. That's basically Temeri, which means we're going to go ahead and move into our, into our review, starting off with ease of play. I would say that there is a lot going on in this game. It's not overwhelming in terms of how complicated it is, but there's a lot of information you have to learn, the individual actions, the sequence of play. They do have an excellent player aid, which really does a good job kind of distilling all the information, but I'd say there is definitely an initial rules uh, load, not a terrible game, and not, not terrible game sounds wrong, not a terrible amount of uh, rules load, but it's definitely a medium weight uh, Euro game with enough information going on there. Uh, game time comes in at around, it's, it's the box says I believe 90 to 20 minutes, and I think that's so far accurate based on the plays I've had. If you're playing a two player game with everyone who knows it, you can probably get it down to 60, but uh, I, I, at higher player counts I don't see that happening, and your first game definitely won't be in that 60 minute range. And again, the box says 90 to 120, so that's, that's totally fine. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, Starting off with what I like, which is the marble system over here, and I'm not gonna, I'm not in love with the marble system. We'll talk about it, but the marble system is a nice little uh, extra degree of table fun to it. You're basically dropping marbles into her with a degree of chaos over here. It is a nice thing that makes it stand out from a classic draw Euro game. I don't think it adds a tremendous amount to the game, but I think it does matter to the game, and also it's just fun for the table presence. And I'm excited for when you actually have a full-on pyramid that looks like a pyramid as opposed to a white cardboard box over here. I'll say that there's multiple ways to focus in this game, and that's gonna be the main thing that gives you a crunch. 
Ancient Temerity. There are a lot of different areas to focus on because everything is going to give you something. You're just trying to figure out where that payoff is going to return fastest because you can start building out your farmers very quickly, as fast as you possibly can, because then when you take harvest actions, you're getting a ton of resources and resource flexibility will really open up the game for you. But then again, so will getting out Sphinxes. If you get out a bunch of Sphinxes early on, you can take stronger Sphinx actions, getting three full Sphinx actions for a single fruit, which is incredible. Uh, there's even one building card that will skip from having to pay that fruit, which means you can constantly cycle these free Sphinx actions, just getting a ton of abilities and or points, which again is very, very strong. Speaking of which, there's the buildings. The buildings are very strong. Getting building flexibility, being able to move up these tracks. The reason you want to move up the tracks, by the way, is because you have to pay extra resources when you want to buy a building higher than your uh, worker over there. And getting a bunch of buildings, both for the end game points, you can get giant chunks of endgame points, much as 20 endgame points for having full sets of different buildings. And along the way, you're also getting in-game scoring as well as immediate benefits and or ongoing abilities. So the buildings are a huge thing to focus on. But then again, so are the priests. You're getting a trend over here. The priests is a huge thing to focus on. If you go up in the temple tracks, you get a ton of points, a ton of modular things, a way to go ahead and earn your extra farmers to get your extra workers in play. And you're gonna get those bonus priest cards at the end of every round. So you really wanna focus on that priest track. And by now you've noticed that I've told you to focus on four different things in the game and that is exactly the problem. On top of all the fact that you want to focus on four different things because they're all going to drive you in different directions, you are constantly trying to manage your cards in the game as well as far as which cards you think are going to give you the actions you need, but which ones are going to give you those bonus actions and which cards are going to be the best suited for your engine. And of course, some cards come with extra resources in them, which resources are often scarce unless you're going full farmer right away, which means getting those extra resources matters. Everything in the game pulls you in a slightly different direction and forces you to consider what's best for your engine at a given point. What's best for your engine based on what the other players are doing? What's best for your engine based on the cards you currently drew, based on the buildings out, based on basically the Sphinx cards in play? Everything is going to give you something that tears you between the different directions as to what you're going to try to do. And fortunately, you have a ton of options at your disposal. It's just a question of choosing which one is right for you at any given point. And so there's just a lot of things to focus on, a lot of things to do, and a lot of ways to feel rewarded as you try to carve your pathway forward. On the other hand, as far as things I don't like in the game, a few small things over here. First of all, I'd say that the trading action I felt was often not satisfying. Sometimes you have to do it because unless you have a good farmer economy, and the tricky part is a good farmer economy is still limited because at the end of the day, you are subject to the weather. There's ways to modulate, to adjust, there's things you can spend to, to, take, out, uh, to take out out sun or water, but at the end of the day, sometimes you just can't re uh, farm resources, which means you have to be mindful of being able to go to the market to get the resources you need, but it often does feel like the weakest action. Uh, from all the actions of the game that are incredibly cool, this one was sometimes necessary, but just felt less fun to do. I wish there was something that, I don't know, made it more fun, but then again, maybe if you did so, it'd be unbalanced. I'm not talking about the balance of the game. It's just a less fun action that sometimes you have to do. I'll also say that the board definitely needs to be a bit clearer. Uh, in this game over here, there are different fields for different resources, and you probably didn't know this at first glance, but this is the resource over here, this is the resource over here, this is the resource over here, which you can barely see at all, and this is the resource over here. There's also little spots over here. This is a spot you can place your farmer. No, it's not generically on the field. This is a spot you can place your farmer. This is a three plus player game spot. That's a four player game spot. If you didn't see those things, you can be forgiven. It's very, very hard to see those things. Uh, overall, I think small aspects of the game, while the game while the board looks visually nice, I think it could be improved a drop as far as just being able to see things a little easier on the board. Not a major complaint, but definitely something to be mindful of. Similar complaint on these cards over here. You can very often barely see the icons in the top corners, which again, just readability is not the best in some aspects of this. But again, prototype, hopefully some of those things will be improved upon. As far as I can see, others not liking. First of all, there's a small aspect of a memory game because you are dumping your resources when you donate them to the gods, you're dumping them behind the screen, which is fine, but at the end of the day, that means someone who can remember what resources someone else donated will be better off. So there's a small little element of a memory game in play. And also as much as the marble system is a nice thing, this is not a major aspect of the game. And it's also very random. I mean, at the end of the day, the way the marbles are going to fall is completely going to change how things play uh, based on your availability to harvest certain fields. And depending on where your farmers are, you may get hurt more or less than that, more or less by that than other players are, which can certainly hurt your game. If you're relying on harvesting and the way the marbles fell out, your farmers can't harvest as much this round, that's just gonna limit your options and your flexibility and that's just due to the randomness of the way, the randomness and chaos of the way things fell out. That can't even be a statistical chance. It's just the craziness of it all. So you may find that frustrating. As far as final thoughts on Tamari, this is one of those games that I've had a harder time trying to decide where I am with it because 
You may have noticed that my what I don't like section is very sparse. There's not a lot of things I don't really like about this game. Most of the things work very well together, and it is a rewarding game that gives you a lot to consider, a lot of different areas to focus on, and a strong puzzle of how to make that all work together to try to figure out what you're going to do. Where are you going to focus? Where are you going to spend time? And most of it, trader action aside, feels very rewarding. You're trying to go up on different tracks and get a lot of things, and it feels very satisfying to get that done, but at the end of all of that, for whatever reason, Tamari hasn't hooked me. It's enjoyable. The mechanics work. All of it meshes together. I do think it's a very rewarding game, and I can see how, I, I for sure can see how anyone can really love this game. For me, I've enjoyed this, I've appreciated this, but I haven't been hooked by that spark of it all. Again, make no mistake, it works, and there's nothing I can pinpoint as far as things I don't like. At the end of the day, when it comes to these Euro mechanisms as far as how they all mesh together, sometimes the game really gets its, its claws into you, and sometimes not. And in the case of Tamari, I appreciate everything Thing this game is doing, but the claws aren't there, if that makes sense. For me, this is a 3.5 out of 5. I think it really is well designed, really very clever, forces you to consider different directions. From a few, few small nitpicks, ultimately I think this is more of just a feeling thing. It's a 3.5 out of 5 for me. As far as other game recommendations, if you're looking for another game that has a uh, gimmicky aspect going on in the middle of the board uh, with a heavy Euro mechanism, check out Sulkin and the giant gears that will definitely uh, be be moving slowly around the board and advancing your workers to different areas in the game. And if you're just looking for that marble fun that you have over here in this little pyramid where little marbles clink together and then eliminate each other, check out Potion Explosion for a much lighter game that takes advantage of the marble system, does a lot more with it, but is definitely a very, very lighter game. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.